with assets totaling over $3 trillion. Bank of America is the second largest bank in the U.S. today. Shares of the company have seen astonishing gains of over 290% in the last decade. Bank of America is, is, is truly massive. They've got something like $2 trillion in deposits and another trillion dollars in loans. They have one of the world's largest wealth management firms, and they're a commercial bank of pretty good scale. And all of that's under one roof, under the Bank of America roof. But Bank of America's rise to success has been anything but smooth sailing. The 2008 financial crisis pushed the bank to the brink of collapse. It was a loss so catastrophic that it required a $45 billion bailout from the U.S. Treasury. Bank of America was one reason why much of the investing public uh, and consumers and government lost faith and trust in banking. If the government did not intervene for Bank of America and the other banks, Bank of America would have failed. Fast forward to today, Bank of America is thriving despite concerns over inflation and threats of a possible recession. The bank reported a net income of $31.9 billion in 2021, compared to just $4 billion in 2008. As the rates have gone up, and if the recession is shallow, then we're going to see widening spreads and the ability of Bank of America to have a significant earnings from net interest income. Uh, this is unique to the banking industry, and Bank of America being one of the largest banks stands to benefit the most. So how was Bank of America able to stage such an impressive comeback? And where is it headed next? Bank of America's story dates back to 1904, when Amadeo Giannini found the Bank of Italy, which sought to provide banking for working immigrants facing discrimination. Bank of America's original business model, when it was still Bank of Italy in 1904, was this notion of finding underserved individuals, groups, and communities. The immigrant community in San Francisco at that time was not welcome in the established banks. So most of them kept their extra cash, if they had any, in mattresses or mason jars in their apartments. A.P. Giannini knew that this money wasn't earning interest, and so he went to the people he knew from his years working on the wharf and said, if you will deposit your money with me, I will pay you a small amount of interest every month. Bank of America was the first bank to establish a statewide branching system which allowed it to rapidly expand across the state of California. From there, the company began relying on acquisitions to grow across the nation. There was a, a very ambitious young banker named Hugh McCall, who in the 80s and 90s basically tried to create his own version of what Bank of America had on, on the West Coast, which is essentially gobbling up competitor banks in the Southeast region. So in, in 1998, Hugh McCall leads the acquisition of Bank of America. So this was essentially Nations Bank, his institution, which was the roll-up of the Southeast, acquiring Bank of America on the West Coast. So for the first time, you had the coast-to-coast -coast branch network. Today, Bank of America has grown to become a giant in the banking industry. It is the seventh largest bank in the world based on total assets, and the second largest in the United States serving approximately 68 million consumers and small business clients. Bank of America has four main divisions. They've got the consumer bank, they've got the Wall Street division, they've got an asset management division, and they've got a commercial banking business. But you could really kind of divide what they do into two big buckets. The first bucket is interest income. Retail banking still remains Bank of America's main focus and source of revenue, contributing to more than a third of its net income. Bank of America held more than $1 trillion in average deposits from retail consumers during the third quarter of 2022. Bank of America is a powerhouse in retail banking. Uh, they increased their deposits equal to the size of the sixth largest bank over the last two years. There's no press release, no merger announcement. This was all organic. They are making spreads or what is called net interest income uh, off of the difference between what they offer as a deposit rate, and then minus the cost of funds that they have either through the markets or the Federal Reserve. In the third quarter of this year, in fact, they made about $14 billion uh, in net interest alone. The other bucket is something that is referred to as fees, which really is inclusive of a wide variety of things, everything from overdraft fees, credit card, to advisory fees for advising on huge M&A deals. 
you know, in the third quarter, they made about uh, close to $11 billion uh, in non-interest income. Bank of America found itself on the brink of collapse just more than a decade ago. Shares of the bank were trading for as low as $2.53 in 2009. And net income dropped from a high of $21 billion in 2006 to just $4 billion in 2008. The financial crisis was catastrophic because it was a perfect storm where banks were taking um, very high speculative risk in certain areas of lending. And the government oversight or regulation really did not keep pace with complex markets. The whole industry essentially started to maximize leverage, started to kind of push, push boundaries. All of this is based on the premise that housing in this country would never decline, that housing prices in this country would never fall. What we saw was that, sure, it could, it could fall and it could collapse. The ill-timed acquisitions of several companies, including Countrywide Financial Corporation and Merrill Lynch, only added fuel to the flame. Bank of America participated in a broader merger mania. In 2005, it acquired MBNA, the credit card giant, and in that process took on a whole bunch of bad consumer debt. In 2008, Bank of America acquired Countrywide Financial. Countrywide had been implicated in the mortgage um, crisis. Countrywide had also engaged in predatory and racist lending practices. And when Bank of America took that on, it took on a huge burden of debt and a, a sort of toxic environment um, and, and toxic asset that in many ways dragged the bank down. And then, of course, in 2008, Bank of America acquired Merrill Lynch. Mortgage derivatives uh, CDOs uh, brought down Merrill Lynch to almost failure before Bank of America stepped in. Um, after that acquisition, Bank of America had to digest both Countrywide and Merrill Lynch while dealing with its own problems. And talk about a headache, talk about you know, ill-timed acquisitions. As a result, Bank of America saw provisions for credit losses rise from just $5 billion in 2006 to more than $48 billion by the end of 2009. After the recession ended, Bank of America also faced legal problems stemming from its various acquisitions, one of which led to a historic $16.65 billion settlement, holding the bank responsible for financial fraud during the 2008 financial crisis. Bank of America was unavailable to participate in this documentary. Bank of America paid $4 billion for Countrywide in 2008, and the final price tag, including all legal costs, was probably 15 times that, close to 50 to $60 billion. And to put that in context, that's more than the tangible equity the entire Bank of America had at the time in 2008. Ultimately, the Treasury Department stepped in to provide $45 billion and a guarantee of protection for potential losses to help Bank of America through its struggles. Warren Buffett also played a pivotal role in boosting confidence in the bank. I recall talking to Warren Buffett about 10 years ago for a magazine piece I was writing about B of A. It really struck me how he loved their deposit base. He thought that was their, their killer advantage. Their coast-to-coast -coast network of branches provided such cheap funding that this is the, really the reason why he decided to invest at the time and, and ultimately decided to save the industry by, by investing $5 billion back in 2011. But the hard-learned lessons from the financial crisis have led Bank of America to undergo significant changes. The big change at Bank of America is that they have gone from irresponsible growth to responsible growth. What they really decided to do after that was say, look, we've got a complete franchise. We're big in all the product lines we want to be in. We have the scale we need to. Now we just need to make it run and make it work together. A more conservative lending standard is just one example of the bank's aim for sustainable growth. One key aspect of Bank of America's responsible growth is to say no and to say no more often and say no to subprime lending and say no to transactions that have too much debt, say no to clients that might be causing a lot of risk so that when they say yes, it's a results in a lot more growth that's sustainable, responsible, and better for their reputation. Another example is the bank's meaningful investment in its future. B of A has, perhaps you know, better than, than most, has done a good job of digitizing their businesses. They're spending money in technology. They're using those savings to buy back stock and to prove their financial performance. 
And that's been the story of certainly the last five or so years of, of B of A. These changes have allowed Bank of America to earn its position as the second largest bank in the United States. The bank's most recent earnings for the third quarter topped expectations with $24.61 billion in adjusted revenue. Coming into this year was one of the favorites, if not the favorite among bank analysts because um, of that coast-to-coast -coast branch network, of that, of that cheap deposit funding, they were seen as one of the big beneficiaries of, you know, the Fed is, is raising interest rates, it's going to allow them, it's going to allow the industry to make more money, uh, you know, in terms of, of just that net interest income that we talk about. And despite the threat of a looming recession, Bank of America's rise might just be beginning. This is a decade in the making in terms of preparation for a recession. So Bank of America has de-risked their loans, they've de-risked their trading, they've de-risked their risk appetite. They've been preparing their technology for bit more business volumes, and they've been, been preparing the strength of their customer relationships for the time when rates rise. And I estimate that so long as loan losses don't more than triple, Bank of America's earnings will go, grow through a recession. And if that happens, on the other side of that, not only should Bank of America stock go back to their historical valuation, but they have a chance to re-rate above the historical ranges where they previously traded.